Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining Duke Science and Society for the latest installment of our uh, coronavirus conversations. My name is Tim McDermott. Of course, if you've uh, joined us before, you will know me. I am the events manager here at Duke Science and Society, uh, broadcasting from my home studio in, in Durham, North Carolina. So just a few brief housekeeping notes I want to knock out before we get started. The chat is open, and I encourage you to send us any questions you might have you'd like our panelists to address. We got a lot of questions ahead of time, but we're always happy to try and address additional questions. Uh, you can send those to either myself or Ben Shepard, and we will pass those along. If you experience any technical difficulties and you're unable to um, stay in the meeting, all you have to do is to your email and click the link I sent you, and you should have no problem getting back in. And the last thing is if uh, I want to remind everyone to head over to the Duke Science and Society website to check out our next conversation. That's June 1st, where our experts from Duke and from industry are going to discuss the electrical power sector and how that's impacted by the pandemic um, and also by recent EPA action. So, uh, don't forget to sign up for that. And while you're there, make sure you learn about the programs and program that we have at Science and Society. Uh, our students, our faculty are dealing with questions like this on a daily basis. And so if you would like and are interested in dealing with these questions, please come and join us uh, in the program. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our moderator here today. I'm sure he's gonna pop on. Uh, video here. Doc, there he is, Dr. Mark Borsig. He is an associate professor of civil and environmental engineering, and along with uh, Dr. Jonathan Weiner, the co-director of the Duke Center on Risk, which is housed right here at uh, Duke Science and Society. Um, Dr. Borsig researches in risk and uncertainty uh, and optimization and decision making as part of his work here, and we're really excited to have him join us to lead this conversation. So uh, please take it away and, and introduce our panelists. Great. Thank you, Tim. Um, welcome again all to today's panel discussion. Um, the title is COVID-19 Pandemic Narrative, What Stories Do We Tell? Um, we have three distinguished panelists today representing, among other affiliations, all three rival universities in the research triangle. Um, we've invited this panel together to explore how the stories being told about COVID-19 are at the root of how we as a society approach management of the virus's risks, and therefore how we are all going about living our lives at the moment. I'll begin by introducing our three panelists before then asking them each in turn to take a few minutes to address the topic. I'll then pose a series of questions that have been submitted by registered participants in advance of today's event. As Tim mentioned, if at any time you have questions you'd like me to pose to the panelists, um, please submit them to Tim or to Ben through the Zoom chat box. Our first speaker today is Dr. Priscilla Wald. Dr. Wald is the R. Florence Brinkley Distinguished Professor, Professor of English at Duke University. Professor Wald teaches and researches contemporary narratives of science and medicine. She's especially interested in analyzing how information emerging from scientific research circulates through the mainstream media and popular culture, thereby shaping the particular understanding by society that's often steeped in sometimes misleading cultural biases and assumptions. In particular, her book, Contagious, Cultures, Carriers, and the Outbreak Narrative, considers the intersection of medicine and myth in creating the stories we tell about emerging infections. Our next, Dr. Brian Southwell. Dr. Southwell is Senior Director the Science in, Science in the Public Sphere program in the Center for Communication Science at RTI International. Dr. Southwell is also an adjunct professor with Duke University in the Social Science Research Institute and is a research professor and lecturer at the University of North Carolina's School of Media and Journalism, an adjunct associate professor in the global public health. Dr. Southwell's research concerns human engagement with electronic information, especially with regard to science and health, and he's interested in the constraints imposed by memory, as well as the amplifying effects of social networks. He's a co-editor of the book, Misinformation and Mass Audiences, which brings together evidence and ideas from communication research, public health, psychology, political science, and information science to investigate what constitutes misinformation, how it spreads, and how best to counter it. You can also hear 
Dr. Southwell's radio show, The Measure of Everyday Life, on Sundays at 6.30 p.m. on WNCU-FM. Our third speaker is Christopher Cummings, Senior Research Fellow at NC State University and Founding Director of Decision Analytica, LLC. Dr. Cummings' research focuses on advancing public engagement, developing risk communication theory, and improving public health decision-making across the lifespan. Dr. Cummings uses a variety of quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods, and his academic work has been featured in a variety of applied science and health venues. Dr. Cummings also consults with multiple government agencies and various Fortune 500 companies on strategic planning, information campaign evaluation and monitoring, and risk communication initiatives. So I think you'll see all three of our speakers are well qualified to speak to today's topic on the narrative or, um, the pandemic narrative or contagion narrative surrounding COVID-19. And again, how the stories told about that narrative and influence the way in which we manage the virus's risks. So I'll start with inviting Dr. Wall to address this topic. As I say, we'll proceed through the three speakers um, followed by questions. Dr. Wall. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, so uh, Dr. Borsak has asked me to talk about the outbreak narrative and I will give you a thumbnail sketch of it. Um, I want to start with the, if I can, I want to start with the um, eradication of the last case of naturally occurring smallpox in 1977 when um, medical professionals involved with that thought that communicable disease was going to be a problem of the past, that it would be maybe chronic or, you know, but not a dramatic apocalyptic problem. While they were making those pro proclamations and really celebrating what this meant for humanity, uh, there were multiple um, appearances in various locations of massive hemorrhagic fevers, um, Ebola, Marburg, Bolivian hemorrhagic fever, but it really didn't catch the attention to the world until of the world until HIV made its rounds visibly in the 1980s around the globe. And at that point, a lot of the people who had been involved in that research and others got together and had a conference where they defined the new hemorrhagic fevers, HIV, other emerging infections as a phenomenon called disease emergence. And they said this was a consequence of globalization. The world was growing. People were moving into new areas of um, habitation, encountering microbes to which human beings were immunologically naive, right? We had no immunity. And also development patterns that were, uh, as the world was expanding, we, we were also contracting and becoming more and more uh, in, in contact with each other. So these things could move around the world potentially much more quickly as HIV had. And they said, we really couldn't leave this to scientific medicine and epidemiology. These were problems that also had to be seen as social and geopolitical and addressed by large scale changes in our globalization development practices and also small scale everyday practices. We really had to change the way we were inhabiting the world. And the outbreak narrative came from uh, this conference. Um, and these were some of the, you know, there were a lot of, you'll recognize a lot of these, visual, uh, it changed our visual vocabulary. It introduced a set of terms and also um, general narratives. And what I trace is how these, these um, uh, images and this vocabulary traveled through from science into scientific journalism, mainstream media, and popular fiction and film. So I'm going to give you a brief sketch of what it is. Now, why is this so popular? For one thing, um, we are told, and this, this is from a, a global health um, primer, we are told, it, it, as soon as we start talking about global health, it seems we quickly move to contagion. And you'll see the subtitle of this is United by Contagion. And one of the first sentences is that health is the, the ultimate unifying issue for humankind. And this is because, again, the shrinking world, the um, globalization, we're increasingly interconnected, and people both down the street and around the globe have an impact on our health. So it's a much broader issue than just um, getting sick. It's, it's not just to be addressed by medicine, but also by politics, our social concerns, commercial concerns, and so on. And I want to pause for a moment on this screen. Um, this is a, a, a phrase that we're all hearing. We are all in this together. And I love the Duke sign. We're all in this together. 
keep your distance. And I think one of the appeals of this thing I call the outbreak narrative is that um, it is about contagion. There is always an appeal of any kind of apocalyptic story. And as you'll see, it is an apocalypse, apocalyptic story. But one of the um, things that I think is unique to contagion is that it is an analog for being human we are fundamentally social beings. We need each other, we congregate, we're constantly in contact with each other, and we also therefore pose a risk to each other. And that's what being human means. And what the contagion story, the outbreak narrative in particular, um, allows us to do is grapple with our excitement and our fears of living in a global world. So very quickly, here are the fundamental components of the outbreak narrative. It is, as I mentioned, apocalyptic. It is always a story, think of the film outbreak or the film contagion, where humanity is threatened by a, a catastrophic communicable disease that, as the one we're living in, um, that is pandemic. Uh, it tells us that we are interdependent, and it also tells us that some lives are more important than other lives. So we're all in contact, but uh, some people are more responsible than others, and some people are more susceptible than others. There is a geography of disease. Uh, the threat comes from the global south, and expertise moves in the opposite direction from the global north, which is not historically accurate, but that's the story. Uh, it ends up pathologizing certain uh, spaces, behaviors, populations, and individuals, as we have seen in this pandemic. And this is really key. Uh, Joshua Lederberg, who was one of the organizers of the 1989 conference, makes the point that it's really hard for us to accept that, that our survival as human beings is not preordained and nature's kind of indifferent to us. Um, his his uh, very well-known quotation, the single biggest threat to man's continued dominance on the planet is the virus, was the epigram to the film outbreak in 1995. And so I think as a result, we tend to animate the microbe. And I see this constantly in the science. People talk about microbial warfare. It is much easier to imagine that this thing that's threatening to us, threatening us, is actually our enemy. It has enmity. It really is out to get us. Um, there is always a kind of us versus them that happens in a crisis. And we have this us them with the microbe. And one of the things I love about popular fiction and film is that, you know, you take a metaphor like microbial warfare. And I say to scientists, think of what that tells you, how you're thinking about, about how you're thinking about the microbe and what it communicates. And people say, well, it's just a metaphor. But when you see it played out, that metaphor in the extended scenarios of science fiction, you can get a better sense of what it means. So one consequence of that that's obvious is that it's very easy to jump from demonizing the microbe to demonizing certain populations that are seen as carriers. We've seen that with Asian populations in this pandemic. But it also has other um, consequences. And you know, there tends to be a kind of mystical quality to the microbe. And very quickly in the popular fiction and film, the microbe often is like the incarnated earth, right? That, that the us them becomes us versus the planet. We have done this damage to the planet. This is the planet's return. And the, the problem with this is a couple of things. First of all, uh, it ends up demonizing the environmental theme that the 1989 conference was trying to communicate, right? That we have to change our practices of how we're living on the planet. Instead, you know, it's the microbe doing this, it's nature doing this, and um, we just have to go to war with it. Uh, it also, many of the characters uh, in these fiction and film tend to be environmentalists. So it really demonizes the whole language of environmentalism, which is a problem in its own right, um, but certainly for dealing with these threats. And ultimately, there's an apocalyptic battle between, on the one hand, epidemiologists and scientists, and on the other hand, these animated microbes that are trying to kill us, or the bioterrorists, environmentalists, or whatever. And um, the epidemiologist scientist side invariably ends up winning. It contains the threat, and we don't have to do anything further about it. And I contend that this has kind of mythic proportions. It renews our sense that we, you know, we humanity, you know, are, are set to inherit the earth and, and, you know, that we don't really have to do what the 1989 conference told us we have to do and change our practices. Medical science will solve it for us. 
So uh, I don't have time to talk about how it manifests in journalism. There's a less sensational version, but it's the same basic story. Um, but I do want to look at why we haven't paid attention to the warnings that have been issued really for the last two decades pretty urgently from the World Health Organization, the World Bank, et cetera, that has been telling us to prepare for these pandemics. And I think the outbreak narrative is one reason. The outbreak narrative affects how we see this problem, how we deal with it. It affects everything from, you know, I've talked about the stigma, but also uh, it affects our response, our treatment protocols, survival and transmission rates, health outcomes. It really, again, tells us we don't have to change our behavior. We just have to um, let medical science handle it. Um, and part of the problem is, of course, economic. Part of the changes we need to make would be infrastructural, they're expensive, they involve universal access to healthcare, they involve um, dealing with the problem of global poverty, which is the single biggest threat uh, vector that turns outbreaks into pandemics, and they involve these changes to our day-to-day -day life we don't want to make. But the World Health Organization and the World Bank has been also telling us for at least a decade that the cost of the kind of pandemic we're living through now would be significantly greater than the costs of preparing for it and making those infrastructural changes. And that is, of course, first and foremost, the cost in human lives, which beyond anything is what we should be thinking about, but also the economic cost. So I wanna leave you with this question. How will we tell the story of COVID-19? Are we gonna to continue to tell it as an outbreak narrative and, and emphasize the triumph of medical science? Um, are we going to tell it as a story of medical science versus enemy microbes doing military battle for the fate of humanity? And that's, of course, a crisis and survival story. We are in the midst of a crisis now. I support the work that's happening on vaccines, pharmaceuticals, and quarantine. Those are tremendously important. But can we stretch it? Can we look back? Can we look at the bigger picture and tell the story as we look back on it some years from now as a story of human beings acknowledging social responsibility for the world in which we all live? This pandemic has shown us how broken our system is, both in the US and globally. Can we tell a story, even starting pretty soon, of how we want to live, I would say, sorry, starting now, of how we want to live more responsibly and equitably in a global world. Thank you. Great, thank you, Priscilla, fascinating. Thanks for introducing that topic. And um, we'll turn next to Dr. Brian Salpa. Brian? Great. Okay, and I'll just share my screen here. Great. Um, well, I think as you'll quickly see, uh, there are really fascinating ways in which I think all the remarks from all of our um, the panelists uh, dovetail. Uh, and so I, I really appreciate being part of this conversation today. Um, Dr. Wald has already taken us back um, you know, in time a bit um, you know, historically, and I, I want to do that um, you know, here as well um, from a slightly different vantage point. Um, her main point, her, her notion that metaphors matter um, really uh, is important as well in terms of setting the stage for um, how it is that we're able to talk to each other. And so I, I want to, um, to emphasize that here as well. Uh, a question that has been raised, um, or, or a declaration that's been made actually, you know, in, in recent weeks is the extent to which we are living through, you know, this unprecedented um, you know, moment. Somehow there's something about um, you know, this pandemic that's um, you know, really shocking and, and different than anywhere we've been before. But um, I think it's also important for us to think about this in the context of you know, the past century or so. And um, when we do that, uh, there are ways in which you know, this repeated um, you know, failure on our part to tell perhaps the right stories, and, and certainly this tendency we have to um, use similar metaphors it becomes really apparent. Now on the screen actually is a, um, an old film strip slide uh, from uh, the 1940s. Uh, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention um, in its earlier incarnation was actually known, uh, and the agency was known as malaria control in war areas. And some of their earliest efforts um, were trying to get people ready for um, you know, this battle that we were gonna do against mosquitoes, essentially malaria. Um, and, and 
that actually has set the stage for the ways in which a lot of science communication work and risk communication work has unfolded um, you know, in the past century. Um, and that matters both in terms of you know, a strategy that may or may not be effective, but also um, in terms of what it preconditions us to be thinking about here um, because communication now uh, you know, doesn't happen uh, with an audience uh, full of blank slates. We have to think about you know, audiences as um, you know, ultimately um, partly a, a function of uh, you know, the stories, the scripts you know, that they've been exposed to you know, previously, uh, the ways in which they've been, uh, culture has uh, socialized people into thinking about certain concepts um, you know, scientifically and, and, and otherwise. Uh, and so one way of thinking about this is um, to try to understand the mental models that people might have um, um, and these can be more or less complex of um, disease processes, of scientific processes, of um, you know, thinking about how epidemiology works, thinking about how government response works even as well. Um, and all of that matters. Um, and it matters what people have been exposed to pre previously in terms of um, you know, current and unfolding conversations. So I thought I'd, I'd take us back just briefly to kind of think through our experience with both um, Ebola and Zika virus, um, because I think in both cases there are some important um, you know, insights that I think um, you know, fit to this conversation you know, very well. In the case of um, Zika virus, there were a couple of observations that you know, we've made uh, you know, there, uh, just in terms of thinking about this from a social science perspective. So colleagues and I um, had an opportunity to do some work in Guatemala uh, right at the time that Zika was um, unfolding. And we sat down and, and talked with um, a number of respondents uh, about their perceptions, about their understanding of how what Zika virus was and, and how it operated. And something that was striking in that um, example was the extent to which we were in an environment um, that had rich experiences with mosquito-borne disease. Uh, with, there's lots of experience with dengue and chikungunya, you know, for example. And so what was really striking in that particular instance was the ways in which there was um, a script for talking about mosquito-borne disease, um, and Zika was plugged right into that. Um, and so on some level, there was this, you know, uh, sort of weariness in the sense of, you know, going to battle yet again with, um, you know, with mosquitoes. But what was missed in that um, story um, was the human element, the very human element, um, because as it turns out, Zika virus is also sexually transmitted. And that was just a missing part of the narrative. I mean, we found that there was actually a, a, a gap there, um, you know, and something that had real consequence um, you know, for uh, public communication efforts and certainly for public understanding, um, you know, at the time. So um, it wasn't as though people didn't have any way of understanding, you know, these diseases. They did. In fact, they were bringing that to bear uh, in talking about and, and thinking about you know, Zika virus and missing this new component, um, the, the fact that the story was us and partly in our interactions, our human interactions. We also know that um, from a public opinion standpoint, from a, um, a social science standpoint, in terms of public understanding of science, that we probably shouldn't be thinking about um, public awareness as static that it actually tends to rise and fall, at least in terms of um, you know, the salience of particular information. And we've got some evidence for this from a, a different um, paper actually related to um, some of that work on Zika virus that appeared in Emerging Infectious Diseases um, a few years ago, in which we looked at a few time trends um, here. We tried to look at you know, news coverage, but then also some indicators of uh, information seeking behavior on the parts of people. We, ha we had both um, social media uh, mentions and um, Google search um, you know, mentions as, or Google search data uh, as well. We find here is a surprising um, almost Lock, lockstep. It may not look like that on the screen, uh, but mathematically, really closely uh, correspondent um, you know, time trends in which you see a rise and fall here uh, of, of the various trends. And so what that suggests is that the salience of information, you know, you've got a news coverage, a recent announcement, and there'll be a spike with regard to Google searches, to social media activity, and then it falls away. So there's this, this both fact that a spotlight can be put on an idea, um, but that at the same time that public sentiment, public awareness tends to be ephemeral. Um, I think that also really matters here. That's another reason to, to think that um, you know, how we talk about these things might matter because it's gonna raise uh, certain attributes um, of the conversation and others are likely to fade or not really be part of, of public consciousness. We also have found um, with some of uh, recent experiences with emerging infectious diseases um, like Ebola, um, that uh, trust and relationships between people and people 
and their relationships to institutions also matter quite a bit. Um, I had an opportunity with colleagues at RTI International to do some work um, looking at uh, perceptions of folks that were inbound to the US um, who were being screened and monitored um, you know, for Ebola symptoms. And um, one of the takeaways from that work was the, the important extent to which um, you know, the respondents' own sense of perception of um, the CDC ambassadors uh, that were meeting them and talking with them at airports, um, that, that really had a, had a consequence and mattered. Um, so trust in institution matters here quite a bit. And stories that um, maybe are carrying over from past interactions also, I think, um, matter in important ways. And I'll get back to that point in just a second. It also is the case with um, COVID-19 that if we look at the information environment, we look at the stories that are being told, um, you know, some of them are, are false, are factually false. And that's something that I think um, we have to pay attention to. And I think that uh, you know, Chris is also gonna talk about that here in just a minute. But I'd like to point out um, there's something about the diffusion of misinformation that sometimes gets missed. Um, and it's that we are all vectors for that misinformation diffusion. And there's certain aspects of our humanity that actually precondition us for that spread. And it turns out the sort of most successful um, instances of misinformation spreading often um, really connect with and, and resonate with um, you know, certain aspects of our humanity, that humanity that we share. And so we tend to think about, just like we might think about um, you know, a virus as sort of this external enemy. Um, similarly, we sometimes think about misinformation as this you know, problem without realizing that part of the issue are actually our social interactions and our social needs. You know, just a, a couple of quick examples to that regard. Um, I recently had the opportunity to travel before the pandemic um, you know, to Australia um, to talk with them about some of their experiences you know, there. And, and they had had um, a, a situation where there's a woman by the name of Belle Gibson um, who rose to fame um, and quite a bit of notoriety uh, on the virtue of her claims about nutritional um, ways in which one might deal with and overcome cancer. She told a story about the ways in which she had supposedly done that herself. The only hitch being that she actually never had cancer and it all turned out to be a big fraud. Um, what was compelling, though, is thinking about Belle Gibson's rise as a spokesperson, what it was about her that was compelling. And part of it is this, the story of hope that she was offering to people. And that's something that I think is really important. Similarly, without naming names, we've seen um, other figures um, you know, rise here on social media circuits. And there is a story that's being told there that resonates with something that is important for audiences, whether or not um, you know, the factual accuracy is really ethically a real a problem here. But there's something about the reception that I think we need to pay attention to as well. And part of the point I wanna make here is that I think we sometimes misunderstand our own vulnerabilities for the spread of misinformation. Uh, and I think it's probably not controversial for me to say that we are as social beings, um, people and, and beings that need connection with other people. Uh, we need social connection. And so we need to interact with and talk with people. Um, and that's gonna be a, a precursor the spread of some of these um, uh, stories. It's also the case that we need hope for the future. And in instances when you see a lack of either of those things, that sets up a situation where um, misinformation can actually diffuse, particularly if it's offering a, a salve for, um, for either of those uh, you know, situations. So a lot of this comes back around full circle to paying closer attention to the relationships of um, you know, audiences to government institutions, to expertise, um, and thinking about whether or not um, there's a pathway there, whether there's an established sense of, of trust, of, of shared um, you know, collective well-being, or if that's part of the narrative, um, or if if there are other experiences that might actually be pre preconditioning um, some of the reception. So we can see here both globally what might be happening with um, you know, the, the stories that we're telling, but also uh, in terms of specific communities and specific areas and specific you know, neighborhoods, there are different stories that sometimes happen um, that have to do with relationships to institutions. So we're already seeing um, you know, worry and concern about disparities uh, with regards to COVID-19, and we might be overlooking the ways in which um, you know, some of those have to do with structural inequity. Um, and there's also uh, an element to this that I think we have to pay attention to, which is um, you know, historical mistrust and good reasons for that, you know, that might exist um, in particular cases. We actually have recently um, seen that 
uh, at, at uh, RTI, we uh, had some national survey data that we collected earlier this spring. Uh, one of the elements that we looked at was um, openness and, and willingness to get vaccinated for COVID-19 should one become available in the future. And we see here um, some really striking differences um, between people as a function of demographics. And it might be easy to um, you know, point to other factors, but I think one of the stories that we really have to attend to is um, one of trust. Um, and that's something that um, maybe we can talk a little bit more about. Okay, so that's my remarks for now, and I'll look forward to your questions. Great, thank you, Brian. Um, we'll turn next to Chris Cummings. Dr. Hey, Cummings. Uh, thank you all for your time. Let me get my share screen going here. And just for, um, I guess, transparency's sake, to some degree, I am also currently doing work with the United States Army Corps of Engineers uh, and reporting to FEMA and, as of yesterday, also to the CDC with some of the work that I'm not going to fully describe here but definitely has inroads. Um, I really appreciate Priscilla and Brian's discussion thus far uh, to discuss kind of the overarching needs and, of, of how we actually discuss uh, pandemics and outbreaks uh, and the human condition that brings us to actually make sense out of all of this. Um, I wanted change gears a little bit and start to look at instead of this overarching long-term narrative to potentially look at some of the smaller stories and news that we see that we uh, all are relying upon as we make sense out of what's going on in this pandemic. Uh, and a lot of this stems uh, first from a book chapter that I wrote with my former graduate student, Ms. Kong Wei Yi, who is now a PhD student in public health at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, and we wrote a chapter for NATO's uh, Science for Peace and security program on hybrid threats where we broke down different forms of quote unquote fake news. And we, we looked at specifically distinctions between different types of messaging um, that may have fictitious qualities. And we note that fake news really exists um, in multiple forms and potentially on some continuum uh, with a degree of falsity and malice. And so at the start of this, we see misinformation as Brian brought up. And this, this can oftentimes be unintentional human or mechanical errors that are passed on uh, oftentimes by unsuspecting individuals. This is the most common form that we see shared on social media where someone may come with a benevolent idea um, and want to protect others and those around them and share uh, information that is simply uh, not appropriate. It's not valid for some reason. Um, this can also be typographical. This can be mechanical where you accidentally transpose a number incorrectly and that may actually have significant bearing, especially when we get into talking about things like uh, the spread of a disease. You might misrepresent that information. Um, and What's interesting about misinformation is that there's, there's no malice with misinformation sharing, that this oftentimes comes from, from a benevolent place. And that's distinct from uh, what we define as disinformation. And this is purposefully manipulated or fabricated information that does have malicious motivations and intentions to persuade, deceive, or potentially harm the viewers. Um, and that is, that is something that is much more troubling. Um, and we see some tension here between misinformation and disinformation, where something that was originally created by the message source with malicious intents to persuade or deceive uh, may be taken by an unassuming individual and then passed along as misinformation to others and we see it spread through networks uh, as such. So um, it's a bit troubling. Um, for how we figure out where we go from here and combating mis and disinformation. Uh, but we need to even figure out that they probably both stem from something like rumors. And these are the substantiated propositions shared for the purpose of convincing others of some reality. And, and we all know of rumors, right? Shh, did you hear about what happened? Or did you hear the latest gossip or news? Uh, and these are unsubstantiated claims. And unfortunately, at the start of outbreaks, at the start of novel virus transmissions like what we've been confronting here, just about everything is rumor. And that becomes something that's quite troubling that I want to touch on as well. Uh, and then we have the big bad wolf in the room with fake news, which is propaganda, which is much more deliberate and systematic efforts. Um, so I want to look at each of these in turn and actually provide some exemplar cases pertinent to what we are facing now, um, both as a nation and a society, as a global society. Uh, and so I want to look at, at each of these four and, and provide at least some touchstones to understand how we're seeing these manifest um, in the current overall narrative of COVID-19. Um, so misinformation, that's that unintentional harm. Um, sometimes this actually happens when people read a scientific report see, hey, there's a wonderful idea in here about how we can protect ourselves. And then they go out and try and disseminate that 
that information. And that's exactly what happened uh, when some folks read this article, which was about a decade old, that looked at effects of temperature and relative humidity of the viability of the SARS coronavirus, which is related to COVID-19, uh, but is indeed a separate uh, virus. Now, this article looked at how long that virus could live on certain uh, materials, and they also learned that when exposed to heat um, and exposed to relatively low uh, forms of humidity, that the virus would die. Uh, and the people read this article and said, wow, that's interesting, because the temperature at which the virus dies seems to be right at the same level as what we might see in a typical sauna. And so they created a YouTube video that said, you know what, saunas get up to that particular temperature. Perhaps what we should be doing is trying to get people to uh, use saunas more often in order to combat the disease. Um, and they said, well, not everyone has a sauna, but you know what most people have in their homes are blow dryers. Um, so maybe what we can do is to uh, try and get folks to actually kill the coronavirus by indeed, dare say it, uh, breathing in deeply with their blow dryer to try and raise their internal body temperature to 130 degrees uh, Fahrenheit in order to kill this coronavirus. Um, and of course, medical scientists have said, please do not do this. Uh, but by the time that this had actually circulated around Facebook and YouTube and other social media sources, there have been tens of thousands of views. Uh, and unfortunately, actual cases of people trying to do just this. Um, we've also seen misinformation where uh, a good scientific principle uh, goes awry, where we do know that yes, on on surfaces, alcohol can help kill viruses. Um, however, drinking alcohol will not kill the virus in you. Um, yet that has even come from a top-down approach from folks like Belarus's president, who has encouraged citizens to indeed drink some vodka, sit in your sauna, and don't worry about it. Uh, and unfortunately, with uh, medical science, we know that none of these are actually uh, beneficial. Um, so that's misinformation. And so this may come from a benevolent place, uh, but it's one that we know uh, is not a, as as helpful. Uh, and so it becomes fake news in that sense. Um, disinformation is purposefully manipulated. Uh, a case here noted a couple of weeks ago when uh, President Trump's valet tested positive for COVID-19, um, a doctored video soon showed up where they completely redid the video and stole Fox News's uh, short segment. And they put that Trump himself tested positive. And they even had a nice voiceover report with a fake journalist saying, brought to you just a moment ago, Fox Fox News alert, the White House medical team confirming President Trump has confirmed positive for the coronavirus. Uh, this is purposefully doctored, purposefully manipulated, um, and probably motivated in some way to try and uh, diminish the respect level uh, of the president in some way. Um, now, both of these uh, tend to start from premises of uh, unsubstantiated claims, and that's what we refer to uh, as rumors. And rumors really rely upon the premise of plausibility. For a rumor to actually gain gravitas, it has to contain information that some people may believe or may wish to believe. Um, they wish that it's true. And we know that certain rumors resonate with certain audiences more readily than others, and they tend to resonate with those who might desire a more stable belief over higher degrees of uncertainty. Uh, when we talk about differences between expert populations um, and inexpert populations, many scientific and medical experts are comfortable with some uncertainty. Do they want to reduce uncertainty? Absolutely, but they understand that we can't get rid of it all the time. Yet, unfortunately, for risk communities, Indicators, this is a big problem, especially at the start of something like a pandemic, when just about all scientific and medical data is uncertain to a fairly high degree. And so we see the rumors taking off, uh, especially early on in pandemics, um, where uh, we wish that we had better information that we could convey. Uh, unfortunately, there is lag in time that it's taken for us to catch up when it comes to medical expertise and scientific uh, data collection and analysis and reporting for us to actually combat a lot of the rumors that we see. Um, now, it's also important to note that rumors attempt to seek out the truth and that some rumors become true. These are just uns unsubstantiated claims. It's not to say that all rumors are necessarily bad or wrong. Many rumors turn out to be truth. Um, however, what makes a rumor a rumor is that there isn't a, a good set of evidence here. And so oftentimes rumors become the driver of mis and disinformation. Um, and dare I say also of conspiracy theories. Uh, what rumors do is they provide opportunities to simplify reality, to take a highly uncertain area and provide a very simple narrative. Um, and 
oftentimes these sources are from a non-authoritative place. We hear it from rumors from our friends, from our close ones, oftentimes not from uh, those who are, you know, quote unquote authorities. Uh, and it's exactly these kinds of rumors that we see take off into conspiracy theories. Uh, as the immortal Cat Sunstein says, some people and some groups are predisposed to accept certain rumors because those rumors are compatible with their self-interest or with what they think they know to be true. Uh, and this seems to be just the case with what we're seeing currently with the conspiracy theory that started as rumor that 5G cell phone towers are indeed causing the virus in some way. Um, if you'd like to learn more from that, uh, I'll plug one of my good friend Jordan Frith's article in Slate, Fearing the Invisible, the long history behind the 5G COVID-19 conspiracy theory, and there's a link there for you as well. Um, Jordan, you'll be happy to know I plugged you in this. Uh, now, all of these things uh, seem to drive um, really bad potential public health outcomes, and one of of the scariest parts of this uh, is propaganda. And, and this is a deliberate and systematic effort to potentially try and manipulate beliefs uh, in, a, in a large sense. Uh, and there are many strategies that we see historically used for propaganda, herd mentality, personal testimonials, plain folks appeals, emotional appeals, transference, ad hominem attacks. And I think that we've seen a lot of these uh, already to date as our pandemic narrative has, uh, has continued. Um, the one that I am most concerned with currently with some of the work that I do uh, is a concept called astroturfing. And astroturfing is kind of the fabricated, manufactured version of what would be a grassroots social movement. Um, so we have had all of the reopened protests around the country um, that kind of have this guise of people taking to the streets, of coalescing and self-organizing in order to uh, provide this level of concern to reopen economies. Uh, and there's actually very good data now that demonstrates that a lot of these uh, organizations and, and organized efforts were actually not grassroots whatsoever and appear to be um, by and large from just a couple of sources who have attempted to blanket the entire country um, with these kinds of, um, of movements. Uh, and that's, that's a definite uh, form of propaganda. Uh, now, I kind of anticipated that we might ask the question, of all of the messaging, which one do we think might be the one that we need to work on the most? And uh, for me, I think it's the, uh, what I call the flu corollary. It's this, this, this idea that uh, COVID-19 is somehow similar to the flu, and I wanted to talk about that, um, especially because over the last couple of years, a lot of my academic work has been looking at trying to improve people's understanding of the influenza disease and and try and improve decision making about getting the seasonal influenza vaccine. Um, so in a couple of studies, we actually looked at differences between using the term influenza vaccine versus flu shot. Um, and in one paper in the Journal of Health Communication, uh, we demonstrated that just simply changing the term influenza vaccine versus flu shot uh, really had very large scale differences. And the idea that using the term influenza vaccine actually prompted much more significant uh, vaccination intention than using the colloquial term flu shot, even when no other information was provided about the disease uh, or the vaccine. Um, and this is something that's quite troubling because the flu is everywhere and that's the term that we tend to use. And so we know that the term flu is something uh, that even from our data-driven exercises demonstrate that we don't actually get uh, the level of severity that people are concerned with or the level of intention to actually fight that disease. And this has to do with a concept called frame semantics. With this idea of frame semantics, individuals make sense of terms by relating that term to others with which they have more familiar knowledge. Uh, and when we're talking about something like COVID-19, I have uh, significant concerns that people are relying upon this flu corollary rather than um, learning more about the actual deleterious effects of this novel coronavirus. Um, now for the flu, the flu is highly familiar and it's generally uh, looked at as having an attenuated risk perception. That is people don't fear it as much as they should, that they have lower levels of uh, threat severity and threat susceptibility for influenza, um, especially when we ascribe it as the flu. Uh, and this is something that's troubling because especially early on in this pandemic narrative, a lot of the discourse has actually looked at uh, 
coronavirus and COVID-19 specifically being similar to the flu. Um, and in one of our papers, we note that while influenza as a term might require a doctor's attention, calling it the flu really means that we might just turn to chicken soup instead. Uh, and this is troubling because in many reports, uh, we are seeing coronavirus and the flu being put up against each other. Um, and even our president has looked at uh, a very simple narrative here. So last year, 37,000 Americans died from the common flu. It averages between 27,000 and 70,000 per year. Nothing is shut down. Life and the economy go on. At this moment, and this is as of March 9th, there are 546 confirmed cases of coronavirus with 22 deaths. Think about that. Um, the actual frame semantic is laid out here rather readily. Uh, and, and I think it's one that may have a strong framing effect where the significant value that we place upon COVID is that it is less than or equal to the flu. Uh, and I think this is extremely troubling because the latest data that we have demonstrates that this may not be the case. And here on this last si slide, I'll share with you um, some of the, the actual comparisons that we have, because I think that what we need to do next uh, in order to help improve our overall narrative is to help fight this particular message that COVID-19 is similar to the flu. Um, so this is a paper that reports the severe seasonal influenza uh, epidemic during 2017 and 2018. Uh, and then we have the most recent work, which is still coming out in July, um, that looks at similar data for COVID-19. Uh, and for influenza and COVID-19, uh, we look at a particular metric um, for all viruses that we call r naught. It's an R with a subscript zero. It's a statistic that we use in order to look at the potential spread of a virus. Now, if the number of the r naught is one, then that means that one person who's positive will likely pass that virus to just one other person. So if there's a virus and its r naught value is below one, then we know that someone who tests positive for it is likely to not pass it on to even one more individual. However, if it's greater than one, we know that we are likely to see the blossoming of outbreaks. Um, so even in a bad, severe Severe seasonal influenza epidemic, the R naught value of influenza is 1.53. Each positive person will actually share it to 1.53 others. Um, most recent data for COVID 19 has uh, the R naught value somewhere between 3.8 and 8.9. So we know that it's likely to be three times to five times as infectious as influenza. So not very similar at all and much uh, more likely to spread. And I think that's why we've seen such a rapid spread across the United States. Um, we also might go, okay, it spreads, so what? It still doesn't have the deleterious effects worse than the flu, right? And that's, that's a tough question. Uh, the mortality rate for influenza is 0.1%. That means that one in 1,000 of people who get influenza will actually perish from the disease. Um, as of yesterday, we saw a new report that that number for COVID-19 might be as low as 0.4%, but it's still others have estimated that it could be all the way up to 6%. So at best, our data demonstrate that it kills four times more people uh, than influenza based upon those who get it. And so is, is quite uh, distinct from influenza. And the last uh, scary statistic is one that, albeit is, in truth is a bit cherry picked, is the number of deaths in 2020. So looking back from January 1st of this year, which is partway through the influenza season here in the United States, we've had 8,000 and 48 deaths as of yesterday. Um, and here we are uh, with well over 10 times that number. Uh, and so we are really in, a, in an era where we're going to have to uh, continue to work diligently as good risk communicators to identify where we can improve risk communication and hopefully help improve the the narratives that are salient and tangible for people to be able to share that can help us all to protect our friends and neighbors. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Chris. Thank you all for your, your comments. And um, I think you all bring diverse perspectives and yet there's some common threads across um, all of our speakers. We've gotten some questions both in advance and during the course of the, um, each of your talks today. And I'm going to um, pull out some of those that I think uh, might be particularly relevant um, and address them um, specifically to one or the other of you, but each of you can feel free to comment. Um, if I could, I'd like to start with a question directed at Priscilla. Um, you 
you, you discussed the role of, um, I, I think what you were emphasizing largely is a kind of larger cultural narrative in shaping our thinking or what Brian has called the mental models associated with COVID-19. I wonder if you might be able to speak to um, what the role might be of personal experience in politics um, in relation to that um, larger cultural narrative in informing our current mental models. I, I, person, I'm not quite sure what you mean by personal experience in politics. My own? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you are on. So um, Brian mentioned um, the importance of, I, I believe, personal experience. What you've personally seen, oh. what you've, um, what you've in, in your own experience with the disease, or um, maybe in a in a broader, um, in a, among your circle of family and friends, that that might be formative in how you think about something. Um, I think Chris alluded to, and certainly we're hearing a lot about how politics mm -hmm. shapes how you think about it. And I wonder if these are special cases of 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 the um, pandemic narrative, or are they something that is kind of complementary or somehow. Um, different from uh, the influences that you identify? Yeah, well, I mean, as I said, I think that general politics invariably um, shapes what, I, what I'm calling the outbreak narrative. So, you know, what we saw this in this pandemic. We saw, we're seeing the way people are using China. And this is happening, I've, I've heard it from both Republicans and Democrats, right? This is a broad sense that somehow you know, blaming China is um, an important aspect of this. But I think, you know, one difference that we've seen, if this, if I'm understanding what you mean by politics, like the small p politics, um, one thing that we've seen is just the mask. How is it possible that the mask has been politicized? So there is just no question that masks not only keep us, the wearer, safer, but has a big effect on keeping everyone around us um, more, you know, protected. And this is what we've, we've all been talking about when we talk about social responsibility, thinking about other people, si signaling to other people that we are concerned about their health, that we understand that not deliberately in most cases, we could pose a threat to them and we will do everything we can to think about others and minimize that threat. Now, why that should become a Democrat versus Republican question is, is should amaze all of us, right? The Republicans and Democrats should not, usually that, that might be economic, that the Democrats have more of a sense, that's a distinction, right, between Democrats and Republicans, more of a sense of spreading the wealth or, you know, that notion of social responsibility or may, may be more in favor of social programs getting financed. But to, to think about that in terms of protecting someone from your disease astonishes me. And there's an example. Do you have an explanation? Is there anything in any of your studies that would suggest because of a particular cultural aspect to the po that's linked to the politics or a particular experience. I think, um, well, I think in this case, Chris gave us a very good example. Our president has set that tone, right? And it's suddenly become a kind of populist resistance not to wear the mask. I'm, you know, in your face, I'm not going to wear the mask. On the other hand, we have, I think, something that's a lot more understandable. We have, you know, a number of people have written about how, say, African Americans are especially men are nervous about wearing the mask because of how people are going to react to them so there's a case where um, it should be a democratic issue that you know we, we want to protect people from the danger of wearing a mask but I haven't seen that at all it really has been in the populist followers of Trump that say wearing the mask is my si or not wearing a mask sorry is my signal that um, I think this is a hoax, or I'm not going to be told what to do, or I, you know, I'm going to take a stand against my democratic governor, or something like that. And yet, we've seen among the governors, Republican governors are telling them to wear masks. Still, in all, all this is coming from this populist figure that we have at the head of our government. Exactly right. So, Brian, looks like you've been you have something to add. Yeah, I was no, those are all important points to be raising and questions. 
to be raising. I, 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 wor I wonder though also if we need to think about this in the larger arc of you know, American history and, and it's, so there's these countervailing you know, narratives potentially and this emphasis that we have culturally on freedom um, you know, I think is something that comes to play sometimes and it sometimes is manipulated or there is a, a, a larger you know, notion there that resonates sufficiently with you know, political messages that you know, people will try to tap into that. I've actually been having some interesting conversations with folks recently about if you go back and look at the discourse around you know, what happened when um, we mandated seatbelts. Um, you know, and in that particular case, we actually were requiring that people keep themselves healthy. Um, we were requiring that they, um, you know, lessen the burden on the healthcare system, and and where, and and even then, under those circumstances, there was quite a bit of of hue, um, of of uh, consternation and, and concern and, and debate. Some of which might have come from uh, a place of a sense of you know, inconvenience, or you know, and and but some of which was probably also um, there's this opportunity to tap into this this uh, larger cultural notion of of freedom, which is not not entirely unique to the United States, but it's certainly part of our our political dialogue um, and and something that maybe is different than in other parts of the world. So. Is there any um, getting back to my original question? Is there any um, this is directed to Brian. Any um, theoretical or empirical evidence uh, on the relative importance of, say, politics versus personal experience versus a larger culture, or cultural narrative in affecting a, a person's um, risk attitudes? Yeah. So or mental models, maybe more broadly. Right. Uh, there, there's been a fair amount of work, you know, in the um, public understanding of science arena to suggest that you know ideology you know, can matter that suggests that we people use values heuristics in making judgments about science so we know that that's you know that's the case I also though something I think we, we probably want to caution ourselves against is um, there are some of these prominent examples um, but we also need empirical evidence as to, and I don't think we have all of that yet as to how prevalent some of these um, extreme examples are in terms of you know, the public psyche. So yes, there are folks gathering on beaches. Yes, there are you know, uh, B-roll video clips of um, pool parties and other things. But there's also been surprising um, high levels of, um, of support for some of these you know, different. And, and, so I, I, and, and the same thing that's true, like trust in science is a great example. There are a lot of headlines you can find that um, you know, suggest that we are at a point of great erosion in, in public trust in science. The survey data, though, actually, if you look at it, it, there are still there's still quite a bit of support for expertise, particularly when it comes to one's own clinician or other. You know, so so sometimes I think the headlines get out a little bit ahead of um, you know what what we know and understand you know, to be the case, and from the folks that weren't necessarily at those at those pool parties, yeah. um, and and so there there's I think sometimes more widespread um, you know, unity, uh, and and basically at the end of the day, I tend to. Um, rely on the idea that most people are trying to keep themselves and their families healthy. Um, they're sometimes doing that with mistaken, mistaken information, and there, there are these other countervailing trends that people will rile people up occasionally. But, but at the end of the day, there might actually be more of a core of support for some of this, um, some of these remedies and um, public health and realize. Yeah. So I've got a question for Chris. Yeah. If we're talking about personal experience, um, I am fine finding that people in my neighborhood are not wearing masks at all. Mm -hmm. So I, wa I, I walk in the morning on the Albuler Trail and startled. There were about 30 people out yesterday at 6.30 in the morning, two people were wearing masks. So I, I think it's a both and. Chris, I'd like to direct a question um, from the audience next to you. Um, a, a, a listener or participant had asked, um, what's the role of scientific, how do we make those scientific facts salient um, in the face of the kind of misinformation, propaganda campaigns, even the larger cultural narrative? Um, and how do we do that without um, hyperbole? Um, this is, this is I, I think, the holy grail question, right? This <laughs> is if we can unlock this, we have figured out to risk communicate. Um, what, we, what we do know is, is that, unfortunately, there is a lag between when a pandemic starts and when the scientific data and medical data actually arrive, right? Um, so you do have folks like Brian who are out there trying to 
collect data as fast as possible in anticipation of, you know, say the upcoming vaccines that we're all uh, anxiously awaiting. Um, and so we're trying to do what we call anticipatory governance, right? We're trying to get ahead of what's coming next and trying to predict what's coming next. So that way we can lay the foundations to at least start to um, approach this from a better sense of a, a place of sense making. And, and data. So this, this is really the conundrum why, why we need to hopefully continue to improve funding in areas like social science um, along with the physical and medical sciences so that way we can start to build better, more robust interdisciplinary teams. Uh, my colleague Jennifer Kuzma, uh, Kara Grieger, Zachary Brown and I recently wrote a, an article for Issues in Science and Technology on this, that we need to start to look at more structural levels of sense making among experts because a lot of us are uh, working in these multi and interdisciplinary teams uh, and trying to make sense out of things that we need a rapid and urgent response um, and we're just not capable of it yet and so unfortunately we're stuck still with the mis and disinformation and keeping everything being rumors right right now we're in this, this era of fact checking and fact checking is the name of the game right now where everyone is trying to verify the reports that come out on social media um, in medicine because when x Experts publish, other experts say, we don't like your method, we need to go back and revise, we don't think that's true. Uh, and so what does this do for things like, as Brian discussed, um, trust levels in authority uh, when even our experts, especially early on, um, don't have consensus. And so this is incredibly troubling. Um, to jump back to your previous question though, Mark, you asked about if there are empirical cases on looking at um, psychographic or demographic uh, notions for risk perceptions. Uh, it, it harkens to me, um, it reminds me of a lot of the work that is kind of the godfather of, of my field risk communication, Paul Slovic, and Paul would be happy in bringing his name up, um, where, you know, in the 80s and 90s, he identified what he called the white male effect um, and identified that by looking at uh, gender and race um, that we saw that that white males were more likely to feel that ah this is not a risk um, and be able to take up more risks because of that. Others have since debunked that it is truly because they are white and you know have that particular set of uh, you know genitalia, uh, but rather it's more about the social placement within society. Uh, and so we look at those who have power, who have. Uh, potential things like access to good medical care and social status who tend to uh, not hold some risk attitudes to just about everybody else. And so we've seen this white male effect um, go to the wayside, but we still know that those who feel that they have a sense of power within society tend to hold lower viewpoints. Um, and I think that this correlates well to a lot of those that we do see um, in the current reopen protests and potentially uh, on walking paths. Um, they may be a part of this demographic. Um, well, as we as we wind down the hour here, and I see some people starting to log off as, as we approach or sort of pass by the um, intended ending point. I wonder if any of the speakers would like to add any last kind of words of wisdom or advice, um, anything they didn't have an opportunity to say. And let's just, let's, um, let's just go right in order of um, how we started. So let's go Priscilla, Brian, and, and Chris. Um, well, actually, I was just going to quickly, uh, sure. I got what Chris was talking about, because the flip side of that is what we've seen of people who are the least privileged, not trusting the authorities. So I think, you know, we've got the privilege to say, I can take the risk and we've got the least privilege to say, I might as well take the risk because I don't know whom to trust and no one's going to care anyway. So I think those are, but I guess if I had uh, one thing to, to uh, finish up with, it really is what all three of us have been talking about, how powerful language is, how powerful our media is, how power, you know, how, how important it is to think about the words we're using, the images that are circulating, the stories that are being how difficult it is to uh, fight them. And I think one of the things I've noticed in this whole uh, pandemic has been an almost superstitious adherence to the very important messages of public health. But as we begin to need to open up. Um, I think remembering that, um, you know, the adherence is important and it's important to think why we're washing our hands, 
but you also can begin to make that so ritualistic that it makes you terrified even to interact with anybody. And that's something we should really guard against. You know, do it safely, but don't not do it. It's okay to start leaving our houses if we think about the rules and why we're obeying them. Thanks. Good point. Brian? Yeah, uh, just just two quick points. Well, three. One, thanks to everybody uh, for being on the phone uh, today and online. Uh, we know we have people, a lot of things going on. And so we appreciate the chance to focus on this. It's a really important topic. Um, you know, just to resonate a bit further with the conversation, I, I just leave with, with, with two points. Um, you know, when eventually the next you know, movie and dramatization comes out of this. Um, you know, rather than as we think about, um, you know, the the war metaphors inherent in a movie like Outbreak, we ought to think about what we can do to put a spotlight on the food delivery workers and the other folks that are really part of 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 this effort, and that might help us move away from you know battling you know the the virus towards um, restructuring society and you know what's needed there. And I think there's there's a way to celebrate that. The other um, thing I, I guess I'd leave people with is just, I, I once had a, um, actually on the, on the radio show, we had a, an interview one time with a woman who does a lot of uh, really important work on understanding language um, as it's used to um, describe cancer um, as that relates to cancer um, you know, victims. And, um, you know, there is real consequence also, when we focus too much on, on battles and, and wars and, and effort that's necessary to do the right thing, um, in terms of um, both stigmatizing and, and telling a story about the victims that maybe isn't quite fair either. So for every time you tell somebody they need to battle, we're, we're going to win this battle against cancer, for those that ended up dying or for the families that you know, went through it, there's a really unfortunate way of framing that that you've just done. And so um, part of what we might do out of respect for the 102,000 that have you know, lost their lives is to you know, think about what story we're telling about how it had a role in that. Um, and it's not a matter of just individual effort. It's not a matter of just um, you know, going to war against the virus, but it's a real reflection of who we are you know, as, as humanity. So, um, so I think there's some food for thought there. But thanks, yeah, Mark, for the invitation. Good point. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, my, my closing comments are to understand that our narrative is not over here. Mm -hmm. um, you know, most states are just beginning to phase reopening. Um, and the work that I'm continuing to do and will do over the next few months uh, is going to be really trying to be as data driven as we can. And, and I do hope that our audience knows that there are many, many good people who are doing um, all that they can from very strange places, including, you know, closets like I'm in currently, um, who are trying to uh, do their best to provide um, some factual verifiable information so that way we can actually base good decisions. Uh, and so while, uh, you know, many people people feel that we rush open and our data demonstrate that yes they are you know even our, our gating requirements as set forth by the White House most states are not currently reaching them um, so know that this narrative is not over uh, while I do agree with Priscilla that yes we can start to emerge and yes we need to definitely worry about um, not just the virus but things like mental health and family structures and communal level uh, interactions um, we also need to to have a good mind that that we are still very much in this narrative um, and so continue to um, be advocates for one another and for your communities um, to you know share maybe what you've learned today um, and to you know improve me media literacy in what you share so that way we can hopefully change this narrative for the better as we move forward yeah. uh, again thanks mark for your invitation yeah. and nice to see everybody thanks and a kind of virtual applause for our speakers thanks for taking the time to join us today um, you're busy um, busy lives and go out and continue the good work that you've been describing today. Thank you all for joining us. If you um, are interested in um, additional um, coronavirus conversations sponsored by um, Society, you can look at the website. Um, these will be regular seminar series. And you can also find recordings of past ones, I believe, on the Facebook site. So um, thanks again and um, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.